So we're looking at the signs of the Lord's second coming. Daniel 7, 9, He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. Now only God is to be worshipped. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. In the previous uh, passage, Daniel 7, 13 to 14, In my Daniel's vision at night, I looked, and there was before me was one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. Clouds could be angelic beings. Psalm 104, 1 to 4. He approached the Ancient of Days, a special name for God the Father, and was led into his presence. This is before Christ was born into his perfect humanity in the first century. We have Daniel's image of him in the heavens. Since only God himself is eternal in essence, then one who reigns over an everlasting kingdom and who gives eternal life. For example, John 10, 28, the Son of Man must be God himself. It is in the name of the Son of Man in which universal judgment is committed to him. And in him was fulfilled the Old Testament prophecy a blessing and salvation through a coming man, a God-man. So here is the second person and the first person of the Trinity. The Ancient of Days is God the Father and the Son of Man, God the Son. All this is a function of God and God alone. So whoever bears the title of Son of Man is God. Jesus Christ claimed that title over and over again, and he fulfilled that title in every detail so far in perfection. MacArthur states, The sovereign judge over the separation of the sheep and goats in his second coming will be Christ himself, the Son of Man. Jesus had earlier declared that not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son in order that all may honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. John 5.22 So God the Father has delegated all judgment and authority to the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The most common title Jesus used of himself was the Son of Man. The Jews should have known this, and that title affirmed his incarnation, his identity with mankind, his time of humiliation and sacrifice, Old and New Testament. It reflected his condescen condescension, his submissiveness, his humility, his meekness, and his gracious love for fallen humanity. It is enlightening to note that our Lord truly acted as a man, of representative man, under the direction of the sovereignty of God the Father and guidance and power of God the Holy Spirit. He imposed upon himself the limitations of his humanity. He did not exercise his deity, his sovereignty over the will of man in his earthly life, and he was often subject to, to the whims and wills of men, but under the protection of the Father and the Spirit. He operated as a man would, who was perfectly under divine protection and guidance, with respect to his assigned mission, an example of all believers to follow. MacArthur continues, that title, Son of Man, also tended to be less offensive than the Son of God. To have referred regularly to himself as the Son of God would have aroused additional and needless hostility from the Jewish religious leaders, and they would have given even less heed to his teaching than they did. In a similar way, to have referred regularly to himself as King would have aroused the hostility and opposition of the Roman authorities, who were quick to suppress any hint of insurrection. In addition to those reasons, for Jesus regularly to have used any such exalted title of himself would have tempted his followers to be presumptuous and arrogant, missing his message of spiritual salvation. It would have greatly increased their already staunch conviction that as Messiah, he would soon overthrow the Roman yoke and establish his earthly kingdom on the throne of David. In addition to those reasons, his referring to himself as the Son of Man provided a profound contrast with the titles and roles he will have when he comes in glory. It suggested a clear distinction between his two comings. On the other hand, his referring to himself both as Son of Man and as Heavenly King re reinforced the truth that he is indeed both. The condescending, humble, and humiliated Son of Man will return one day as the glorious sovereign reigning and judging king of kings and lord of lords. For a long while the Jewish people and certainly their religious leaders knew that Jesus claimed to be a kind of king because he claimed to be Messiah. It was because they hoped that as Messiah he would conquer Rome and reign over a delivered Israel that they had acclaimed him during, their during his triumphal entry, Palm Sunday. 
There was no misunderstanding among Jews that Jesus claimed to be Messiah, the coming great king. Nor could there be any misunderstanding that he claimed to be God's own son. Recall that there were a number of sharply differing factions among religious Judaism who differed the most, almost violently on how they interpreted scripture, including terms such as Son of Man and Messiah. The one common denominator was to rid themselves of Roman oppression. Our Lord represented to them at times the possibility of accomplishing self-rule through him, especially with the way the people at first followed him. Shortly after, however, the leaders began to realize that our Lord represented a mindset, a divine viewpoint, that was diametrically opposed to theirs, human viewpoint, which indeed threatened their own power base, so they ought to rid themselves of him. But publicly, Jesus never was always judicious in the way, nevertheless, was always judicious in the way he made such claims. He did not want to needlessly incite the ire of his enemies. So interestingly enough, in his perfect humanity, he still was was uh, going to uh, be sure that he didn't go ahead of his time and didn't incite people to uh, crucify him or kill him before that. Now, however, in privacy with his disciples on the Mount of Olives, he unambiguously declared that he, the Son of Man, would one day take his rightful place as the great king and judge. As the great king and judge. So Matthew 24, 30 continues. At that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky, perhaps angelic beings, with power and great glory. The, great, the Greek word, which is translated sign in Matthew 24:30, is in the subjective, subjective genitive case, which indicates that Jesus Christ himself is the embodiment of that sign. He is the sign himself. He will manifest himself in his full glory the glory of Almighty God, made manifest to mankind and creation in many ways, including an unimaginably brilliant, pervasive, omnipresent light in his second coming. Many will run in terror and hide from him, but some from all nations will mourn over their sinful condition at the approach of the Son of God and believe in him as Savior. All Israel will do that, fulfilling the new covenant that God has made with the house of Israel and the house of Judah that they failed to make over the millennia, many times, even in Acts chapter 2. MacArthur continues, The clouds into which Jesus ascended and on which he will return seem to be distinctive. The psalmist wrote of God using clouds as his chariot, and Isaiah pictures the Lord riding on a swift cloud. But whether the clouds of the sky in which Jesus appears are natural or supernatural, his use of them at that time will be extraordinarily unique. In the midst of black chaos, he will use those clouds to manifest himself in his complete divine majesty. No one on the face of the earth will fail to recognize who he truly is. Revelation 1-7, look, he Christ is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So it shall it be. Amen. So Revelation 1-7 truly does describe Christ's second coming in a universally visible and knowable manner. Although many state that the rapture is described right in this passage and in Matthew 24, it however is not established that the rapture and Christ's second coming are the same event or part of the same sequence of events such that the rapture would have those characteristics of Christ's second coming. If Revelation 1-7 occurs after the seven-year tribulation period, this is not directly stated in this passage, but it is so indicated in the parallel passage in Matthew 24, 21 to 20, 31, especially 29 to 30, which directly describes the same event as occurring after the tribulation. If Revelation 1, 7 occurs after the seven-year tribulation, then both passages occur after the tribulation, and neither passage can include the church or the rapture, because church-age believers are not to be subject to the wrath of God, which is poured out in the greatest quantity history has ever known during the tribulation period. Compare 1 John 5, 9, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, Revelation 3, 10. The passage which described the rapture, the catching away of the church-age believers, up to our Lord in the air, do not include any descriptions which one could conclude make the event of the rapture universally visible and knowable or related to the events which are described in Revelation 1, 7 or its sister passage in Matthew 24, 21 to 31. 
compare 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 54, and 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. This 13 to 18 really describes the rapture, caught up in the sky and uh, in the clouds. The Lord will bring him back to heaven. So he doesn't come down to the uh, surface of the earth. He remains in the clouds and elevates people from dead in Christ to alive in Christ, evidently putting them in their resurrection bodies, bringing them back to heaven to marry them and bring, come back with him in his second coming. So John 14, 3 and 2 Thess 2, 1 also cover this. So Matthew 24, 30 to 31, at that time the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all the nations will mourn. So the Son of Man is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the Son of Man the same. Da Daniel 7, 13 to 14. In Matthew, we have other passages. So at the time the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn, they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven, with the angels, with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from all points and directions, from one end of the heavens to the other. So from one end of the heavens to the other, this is all, all other than to the other, the saints who are already in heaven, will be brought from all points in heaven to the angels of the earth by any angels. Notice that scripture says that Christ will gather all the nations, all the saints, which will comprise those who are in resurrected and immortal bodies, including Old Testament and church age saints from heaven and not the tribulation saints who are still physically alive in immortal bodies on the earth. So this is not in heaven. Okay, so... He will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from all points or directions, from one end of the heavens to the other, not from the earth. Scripture is not specific as to whether the saints from heaven will be gathered at precisely the same instant that the mortal saints are to be gathered. Also, if the mortal tribulation saints are to remain on the face of the earth, to live on into the millennium and pre-populate the earth and die in their time then it is questionable as to whether the tribulation saints who are still physically alive on the earth would be raptured, gathered up into the heavens above the earth, where the physical bodies would not survive. That, that would make Satan the victor, because there would be no humans to, for Christ to rule over in the millennial rule. So Matthew 24, 31-46 indicates that all the nations will be gathered before our Lord, saved and unsaved. This may be the time when the elect who are living on the earth in mortal bodies will be gathered to our Lord. Compare the parallel passages in Mark 13, 26 to 27, which emphasizes the gathering of the elect from both earth and heaven. At that time, men will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, and he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. There will be the sound of a great trumpet and a great shout and the expression of the unimaginably great power and glory of God, for this is Christ's second coming. So at that time, in Matthew 30, 31, the sign of man will appear in the sky. All the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from the one end of the heavens to the other. And with our Lord will be all the saints of all the ages past and those of tribulation saints who did not survive and are in heaven gathered by the elect angels from the farthest points of the heavens, an immense army of millions. And all of the surviving tribulation saints will likewise be gathered up by the angels. But scripture is silent as to whether the gathering time and place of the mortal tribulation saints on the earth will be the same times as to the same places as the gathering of the elect from heaven. Note that this passage does not specifically state the location that this army of all the saints and angels will be gathered to. They should be gathered. Now, in Revelation 19:19. 19, 19, then I saw the beasts and the kings of the heaven and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse, who is Christ and his army. Presumably, Christ's armies will be with him until the end of the tribulation. <clears throat> Let's investigate scripture here to determine if Matthew 24:30 to 33 is speaking about the rapture or includes anything at all to do with the rapture. First Thessalonians 5, 9 and Revelation 3, 10 both state that believers of the church age will, be, will not be subject to wrath. And these passages do state that the church age believer will not be subject to wrath. And if Titus 2, 13 says, while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of a great God and Savior Jesus Christ, signifying a hope of blessedness, not of wrath, and it does, then the doctrine that the church has to go through the tribulation 
and be decimated by the catastrophes and judgments that occur, including